They were asking for open dates. Everything had to be calendarized or I'd forget. In that process, I was like, oh, it doesn't matter because in three weeks I'm quitting my job and I'll have a ton of free time. <laughs> like no one had any questions. It was just like, okay, do we want a, you know, a Southern brunch or, or a buffet? And it was just kind of like, oh, no one asked any questions about it. I didn't think that was odd at the time, but in hindsight, that's a really odd thing. Because if I said I was pregnant or if I was moving to another state, I feel like there would be more conversation. There would be more follow-up questions. You're listening to Financial Grown Up with me, certified financial planner, Bobby Rebel, author of How to Be a Financial Grown Up. And you know what? Being a grown up is really hard, especially when it comes to money. But it's okay. We're going to get there together. I'm going to bring you one money story from a financial grown up, one lesson, and then my take on how you can make it your own. We got this. Hey, grown up friends. Question When was the last time you asked a friend or a loved one how they were doing financially? Probably never beyond a general check in if they lost their job or if they got a new promotion or a new job, something like that. It often feels like you are overstepping a boundary, right? But with so much going on in the world and so many of the people we care about suffering economically, or at the very least having economic uncertainty, maybe that is something we should be talking about more. Which is why the conversation I had with Julian and Kirsten Saunders of Rich and Regular is so important for all of us. They both quit their jobs and at least initially their friends didn't really ask much about the business that they were starting. Had they tried a new diet or maybe announced a life event like a new baby? Well, there'd probably be a lot of questions asking for all the details, but with money, If anything, we tend to use code words, which Julian and Kirsten will explain in the interview as well. Here are Julian and Kirsten Saunders, aka Rich and Regular. Hey, Julian and Kirsten Saunders of Rich and Regular. You are both very much financial grownups. Welcome to the podcast. Hey there, Bobby. Thank you for having us. And I'm so glad to... to, E meet you, Kirsten. We haven't met in person. And Julian, of course, we are familiar. We're friends, I should say, because we were co-hosts on Money with Friends. And that was so much fun getting to know you there. Now we're going to have your other half on board and talk to you about the new ventures that you guys have going on. Tell us about, for example, your YouTube channel. Yeah. So we launched our web series called Money on the Table because it blended two of our favorite things, money and food. And so we also recognize that a lot of the conversations that we have about money are at our dinner table. And so it was our way of inviting people to pull up a chair, sit down and join us as we have uh, what are sometimes awkward or funny or insightful conversations about money. And I enjoyed watching the very first episode of that series. And I asked you guys for your money story to share more about something that Kirsten actually mentioned which was talking to your friends and family about leaving your full-time jobs to do your full-time salary jobs, I should say, because this is very much a full-time job, what you do now, just to focus on building rich and regular and the business and communicating to more people. Can you tell us that money story? What was it like? Yeah, for me, um, it was a lot of waffling to even decide to leave. I quit my job about a year and a half before we were planning on me leaving. And it just got to a point where my time was better spent doing something else. I just felt like my days at work were wasted and that I was losing a lot of energy and creative space to do the thing that was bringing me the most joy. And so I had started talking to Julian about potentially leaving early, probably six months before I actually built up the courage to do it. And in that process, he kept pushing it back to me like, this is a you thing. You need to decide. (laughs) And so I finally decided. And the first people I told were my parents. And they were just kind of like, okay. (laughs) And then when I told my friends, it was in the context of planning a brunch. They were asking for open dates because I had already trained them. Like everything had to be calendarized or I'd forget. And in that process, I was like, oh, it doesn't matter because in three weeks I'm quitting my job and I'll have a ton of free time. <laughs> and it was like, no one had any questions. It was just like, okay, do we want a, you know, a Southern brunch or, or a buffet? And it was just kind of like, oh, 
no one asked any questions about it. And I thought that was, I didn't think that was odd at the time, but in hindsight, that's a really odd thing. Cause if I said I was pregnant or if I was moving to another state, I feel like there would be more conversation. There would be more follow-up questions. And it, by the way, and in the show, what struck me is that you talked about, if you were talking about the latest diet, they would have probed every little detail. And yet when you talked about this major life change, no one asked you, how are you going to have income? What's going on? Tell us more about your business even, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It just, I feel like there are certain milestones that we're conditioned to ask about and other ones that we're not. And anything that requires insight into money or finances or, you know, how the family's going to survive. I'm using air quotes, but like, those are the things that people are uncomfortable asking about probably because it feels invasive. What did it make you realize about yourself? Do you feel that you ask in, if you were in the other position, do you, looking back, do you ask friends, do you feel comfortable asking them? That's a great question. I, I don't think I do conversationally. I eventually get to be curious like in other conversations, but if someone told me like, I quit my job, the first question isn't like, well, how are you going to make money? <laughs> I I might ask other questions like, oh, what happened? Or how did that feel? Like I'm more concerned about their psychology than about where the money comes from, the finance part of it. I want to circle back to this in just a few minutes, but I want to get Julian's story. So you were a little bit ahead of the curve from your wife um, in terms of leaving your corporate life. Tell us about that experience. Was it similar to Kirsten's? Uh, no, actually. Um, I made the decision to quit about 24 hours before I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'd been leading the charge. I mean, my wife had our first son in 2017. And literally a few weeks after that, we launched the blog. It was a project that I just felt really passionate about and we were both doing it, but obviously she was a bit occupied <laughs> with a newborn. And so it was just kind of something that I that I launched um, because I thought that it was important, but slowly but surely it built up, it was gaining legs. And I started to learn more about um, how it could turn into a business. And as I started to really envision what I thought the possibilities were, that was bucking up against a time at my job where things were just getting really, really difficult. We had rental properties, you know, the market was doing well, our portfolio was doing well, our business was doing well, and we had so much wind in our sails. I really just realized that, you know what, I, I don't need this. It was really, really stressful. There was just bad times we were going through, who knows what version of a, another type of transformation or reorganization. Um, and so the combination of work stress, dealing with a newborn, I just said, you know what, it's time. If we're going to make a bet on anything, let's make a bet on ourselves. And I'm really, really glad we did that. But to Kirsten's point, when I decided to quit, no one asked any questions. It was kind of like, okay. And I presume they just thought that I land on my feet, which I think is a fair assessment. But I don't think at the time anyone really understood. Uh, in fact, I don't even think I really understood that we'd be uh, working on Rich and Regular full time. We were still, you know, had one foot in and one foot out. But um, I think it really speaks to just how taboo talking about money is. And now you're both in this business full time. What kind of conversations, if any, do you have with your friends and family? Do they ask, how do you guys make money? You know, yes, they do ask those questions, which I think means it's working. What we're doing is forcing people to really look at alternatives and to look inward with respect to how money impacts their lives. And yeah, they're, they're all asking those things and they're kind of blown away when we share the endless list of ways in which you could earn money um, on the internet. And so uh, through us, they are learning about that. And hopefully for those who are able and interested, they might even consider exploring this as a path for themselves. One thing that stands out that you guys talk about a lot is the idea of coded language when it comes to money. Can you explain what that is and how it applies to what you guys have gone through in transitioning from corporate jobs to having your own business that a lot of people are curious about, but maybe are hesitant to ask the questions. People use this whole different choice of words. Yeah. It's funny because we even catch ourselves doing it every now and then, but I don't know that it's that different from what people do in relationships. And so you, you use just enough language to make the conversation not seem awkward but you're not really saying anything. Like you didn't answer the question. You didn't, you know, like give the person what they were looking for. And you didn't even explore inwardly what you 
potentially could have uh, in order to get to the root of the conversation. But but yeah, I think there was a, a moment in the episode where we were talking about how much money you make. And now that I think about it, it almost seems like an SNL skit, but it's, yeah. it's like, these are very real conversations. It's like, well, you know, I'm doing okay. Right. And it's like, that doesn't mean, you know, you don't ask how much money you make, but you kind of signal when you say I'm doing okay, or uh, we make good money or um, what was the, the last one? The upper level. Oh, I uh, can't complain. I can't money. complain. <laughs> <laughs> can't complain. You know, things are going well. And it's like, there's all these things. And so, you know, same thing in work culture, you know, you get on the elevator with your friends and you ask how they're doing and they say, live in the dream, you know, it, it, <laughs> and what they really mean is I'm here, <laughs> I'm here, I'm surviving. I really just, I would love to be anywhere but here right now, but they know they can't say that. And so they signal by using this really fluffy language. And as funny as it is, I think the problem is, you know, we don't learn that way. We don't really understand how we feel or even respect how other people feel when we continue to use that language. And so we're hoping to inspire better conversations about money by uh, exhibiting it. One of the things that I think is an interesting theme that you bring up is the balance between being transparent to help each other and help your friends and family by being a little more detailed. You joke about six figures can mean really anything, but we, you know, generally good, but it could mean so many different things. But also respecting that, you know, there are privacy, there are boundaries that you need to respect as well. So how do you balance that? Especially these conversations about when people probe about your business. In a way, it seems like Kirsten, you wanted them to ask you more, but yet maybe not too much more, right? How do people navigate that? Yeah, it's one of those things that you have to test and learn, try and and see what happens because the answer is going to depend on the relationship that you have with someone and the trust that you've built in that connection. Whether or not your boundaries are going to be violated or respected depends on kind of what you've set the tone with before the money conversation, which is why we stress that money conversations are rarely about money. If you don't have a foundation of trust and respect and love in some circumstances, you could end up being hurt by that conversation. It could be something that prevents you from talking about money going forward. So it is this awkward dance that doesn't really have a straight answer, which is why we love video so much, because you can see the brow furrow or the frown show up or the smile disappear or the laugh. There are these nonverbal signals that tell you like, I'm okay with this conversation, even though to Julian's point, people don't have the words to say, yes, let's keep talking. (laughs) You kind of have to look for the invitation in other ways. So what is the lesson for our listeners from your experiences, especially your experiences communicating that you are making this big life decision? I want to say that the lesson without sounding flippant is that people really don't care. Your job, that's not the part of you that they care about. What you do for a living or how you make your money is not the part that people obsess over the way that you may think that they do. It's more around, do you feel confident in your decision? Do you feel good about it? And if that's the case, then I don't have any follow-up questions for you and I don't feel the need to pry. I love that. Julian? I, in a very rare uh, moment, I, I agree with my wife. One hundred. This recorded. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I was nodding my head and saying, "Yeah, I actually think I think you're right." It's it, because as I was flipping through several instances, I think she's absolutely right. Most people really don't care. You know, in fact, what they're talking about are the good old days, right? Not your future. They're not worried about your future because they trust you. They love you. They want what's best for you. And, you know, they're going to support you however they can. But uh, to her point, we tend to overcomplicate those things because we assign so much value to uh, these other things. And we kind of just make these situations muddier than they need to be. And we're not perfect, right? I mean, we, you know, we trip over our own words and say hurtful things to each other, you know, probably more than than necessary or usual, but uh, we're human beings. And we, we hope that that uh, shows uh, through in the web series and, and really any other form of communication that we put out there. And so it's really just to encourage people to say, hey, don't be so afraid to make yourself vulnerable. You know, I feel like I'm channeling Brene Brown right now, uh-huh. but, yeah. um, but, but it's true. You know, don't be so afraid to make yourself vulnerable. Be honest, um, because really, really beautiful things come out of making yourself vulnerable. Perfect answers. Thank you so much. 
let's talk about your everyday money tip because it's so appropriate given these unique times that we're living in where we really have to take the little things when we can. Yeah. So my everyday money tip is to focus on elevating or leveling up the things that you touch every single day. So for us, that is the towels, the sheets, the coffee, the silverware, the things that I touch every single day or interact with every single day. When I really, really enjoy them, it's like a little surprise that just extends its way through the day versus it being, you know, concentrated in uh, something that I might touch every so often. And so for us, I just upgraded all of our towels and bedding and... (laughs) I'm, I enjoy every shower. I enjoy going to sleep every night and waking up and interacting with those things all the time. And Julian noticed right away. Absolutely. <laughs> I slept like a baby last night. And the towels. <laughs> yes. I was drier, quicker. I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, you know what? We're going to leave it there because I want people to go to your YouTube channel and hear, because there's actually a lot more to the story about, especially the sheets, but especially the towels. There's a lot of details you guys need to hear about the towels. <laughs> so we'll leave a link for sure in the show notes to your YouTube channel so people can get the full details. But tell us more about what you guys are up to these days now that you are full time, fully invested in the rich and regular brand and where people can find out more about you and be in touch. Sure. So when we're not filming episodes of Money on the Table, we are writing feverishly. Uh, We signed a deal with Portfolio Books, an imprint of Penguin Random House. And so our book, fingers crossed, should be on shelves by Q1 2021. Uh, We're really excited about that. And in the meantime, people can find us at richandregular.com. We're also on all major social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube. All right. Well, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Bobby. Okay, my friends, here's my take. Financial grown-up tip number one, ask if you can ask. If you have a friend or a loved one having economic trouble or success, let them know that while you don't want to pry, you'd love to hear more details if they feel comfortable or as much as they feel comfortable sharing. You might be surprised at how much they appreciate your interest. Financial grown-up tip number two, a follow-up to the Saunders tip about upgrading your stuff that you use every day and how great that is. Don't forget that when you do that, don't hold on to the old stuff. My family and I have been cleaning out and we realized, for example, that I have two sheet sets back from what we use now, just sitting under the bed in a container. Now, we have the only king-size bed in our house and the odds of us having to regress to those sheets is pretty small. And yet, We've been holding on to them. Why? We're letting it go. And maybe you can consider doing that as it applies in your house. In between my own summer clean out, I have been working hard on some grown up lists. You can get on the grown up list for free at my website, bobbyrebell.com. It has all kinds of suggestions and ideas for living a grown up lifestyle. I've been pretty quiet on the social media front, by the way. A little burnout, to be honest. I just, I just needed a break but I do plan on starting to share more soon. And I would really love to connect with you there and maybe communicate a little bit about what's been going on. You can DM me. The Instagram is bobbyrebel1. The Twitter is bobbyrebel. You see, I'm even forgetting what my handles are because I've been very delinquent on social media, but I miss you guys. And I love hearing what you guys have to say, both about the episodes and just sharing what's going on in your life. So please be in touch there. You can also, by the way, email our team, at hello at financialgrownup.com. And if you're looking for some new podcasts to listen to this summer, please check out my other podcast, Money with Friends. We have a rotating cast of co-hosts who are amazing and by the way, have included Julian Saunders. Learn more about it at moneywithfriendspodcast.com. Big thanks to Rich and Regulars, Kirsten and Julian Saunders for helping us all be financial grownups. Financial Grown Up with Bobby Rebel is edited and produced by Steve Stewart and is a BRK Media production.